And yet, so we've had a, a lot of a chance, I, you know, one of the, the, the benefits of my job is that I really, I just get to talk to a lot of architects from a lot of places. And um, that, that visibility uh, has, has been one of the, 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 the sort of greatest, sort of the greatest treats of my job is uh, I, I've done video interviews, uh, corporate assessments, uh, and, and uh, many of those I'm going to just see if I can share here. Uh, so sharing not enabled here. There we go. No. Uh, ah. Okay, let me know if you can see that. Yeah, we can see that. All right, great. So again, you know, I get a, an, I get an awful lot of visibility into into organizations of different sizes, uh, different uh, from different cultures. I mean, everything from uh, things like uh, banks in in South America to to startup organizations in America to uh, government agencies in Europe, et cetera, uh, as well as getting to work with uh, ATD and some of the clients there, uh, and 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 obviously. Um, so that gives us a lot of sort of picture of what architects look like and successful architects look like. And um, for us, the, the, this has been, for me, this is the most exciting part of the journey. It's, it's getting to talk to architects about what's working and what isn't. Um, we still say our enterprise architects and solution architects and business architects. Uh, again, at ISA, we're much more interested in what's the architect part of this. And how do you, how do you learn from, uh, you know, the, how do we learn from each other? Now, again, related to that, our definition for years of architecture has been the art and science of designing and delivering valuable technology strategy. Now, we love to call this digital uh, these days, but it's actually much more a process of, of, of uh, strategy related to business outcomes, uh, and and whether we call that digital or at ISA, we call that business technology strategy uh, as a core pillar of the skills of an architect, but more importantly, a, a capability of an architect team. Now, think about that in terms of your traditional sort of EA role, which uh, might be a sort of top-down PowerPoint, uh, ivory tower governance focused kind of group, uh, trying to do large application portfolios and, and very IT centric components. And, and switch that into a very proactive, innovative, uh, value delivery focused organization that, that, that delivers on the horizontal, uh, in these horizontal value streams like I've been talking about. And that is really our focus. Uh, as we have heard time and time again, really, uh, say we just ran a we'll have uh, we just ran our, our latest um, EA survey so you'll be able to to download that from ISA soon um, and we've seen that legitimately global business leaders uh, consider digital transformation and digital technology as a top priority uh, it, you know in these days we've really I, I believe emerged from this concept of technology as an enabler and realized that technology is business. It, it, they are synonymous. And, and everybody from Bill Gates to the, to the CEO of the world's largest bank have, set, have said this exact thing. And so I think it's time for, for uh, architects and, and IT in general, not, not just architecture, but really IT in general, to begin thinking about taking leadership roles instead of reactive roles uh, inside of business thinking. So again, uh, I, 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 I've, always, I've always said, if you ever say the words, the business, I always say use quotes because uh, you are the business. If you are a technology strategist, you are as much the business as sales, marketing, operations, finance, um, you know, or any of the other critical business functions. Uh, the, the trick there, of course, then is how do you make that switch? And what we, the, the number one lesson that we've seen is, you know, architects are product owners, not as well as uh, what, what we call technical product owners. Now, I did a, a great interview with the CIO of Transavia, uh, the, the, uh, it's kind of a low cost airlines here in Europe. And the, the conversation 
related to their adoption of safe and scaled agile and some of those things. And, and you know, he said during the interview, he said, look, I have two product owners on every major solution and every major product or program. So whether that's enterprise architects working on large program delivery or solution architects working on maybe some smaller aspects of, of or smaller pro products, uh, you know, I have a product owner that helps to understand business, uh, the, you know, business specific priorities, whether that's finance or flight logistics or, 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 you know, maintenance crews or things of that nature. But I also have a technical product owner whose real responsibility is to ensure that we're using technology, whether it's operational technology or it's IT technology, or it's somewhere a mix in between with IoT and AI. Uh, that is actually responsible for generating us a profit from the technical investment. And, and to, to highlight that, I always talk about this concept of architecture form. And for me, the word form is about the outcome of an architecture. So I always talk about, you know, it really doesn't matter what it looks like while you're building it. We spend a lot of time talking about agility, not in the sense of enterprise agility, and the velocity of decision making and the velocity of value creation, we end up talking a lot about scrums and you know continuous develop delivery and things like that. Uh, when what we're really interested in is continuous value delivery and form. For me, uh, and there's a great book called Agile Software Architecture uh, that that talks about form is about what we achieve in the outcome. And this is one of my favorite uh, buildings. It's actually a museum. It's actually the Walmart Museum, uh, and I just it's a it's a it's a really awe inspiring place when you're there physically, and so we need to start thinking about these outcomes, and this is where we talk about uh, and what we call um, ADDA, which is architect digital uh, architect driven digital advantage, and that means that architecture happens um, from from innovation all the way through operational excellence and outcomes. Uh, and that value management, capability transition, program investment methods, uh, and idea management, idea delivery uh, are as essential as operate, or, or even more essential as, as, than operational excellence. Uh, for too long, architects have sort of tried to do other people's jobs better than them. You know, we're going to be the best technologist in the room, as opposed to being the best uh, digital transformer or change agent, uh, as we've been saying in the room. And so this, this ADA advantage uh, that we're building into the IDABOC is one of the most critical lessons uh, that, we, that we have to learn is that whether you're a, an application architect or an enterprise architect or a business architect, digital transformation, digital advantage is our primary objective and it creates a lot of benefit for the organization. Um, the other thing that I, I want to point out here is that uh, one of the lessons is that while design may emerge, meaning whiteboarding and, and we, we come up with things, architecture is proven. And what does that mean? What that means is, you know, you don't see this is that same building uh, where, you know, it, it's, it's it, it, obviously you see the design is there. You see what it's going to look like. Uh, you see the structural and quality attribute uh, elements that realize that form, that the, the structural elements realize the outcome, but that speed alone or, or functional focus alone can actually undermine uh, the form, right? So we talk about architecture is proven because it, it, it's not something that we, we just throw together at the last minute. We need to have a coordinated, capable team that's able to see uh, how this, the, this, uh, the, this, the outcomes of these different products are going to work together to create a comprehensive uh, customer experience, a, a comprehensive uh, a value creation engine, whether those are operational technologies and, uh, and, and uh, supply chain management, inventory management in, in more retail or manufacturing spaces, or whether those are uh, you know, the, the, the timeliness of planes and the safety and the security uh, of, the, of the customer's experience. So again, we, we've uh, spent so long in IT teaching ourselves that faster is better and in many cases, it can be a value quality, but keep in mind that form itself 
is more about, uh, as Martin Fowler said, the important stuff, whatever that is. And this is where we start getting into what is a, a sort of high quality architectural focus, right? We get into what, what, what does an architect need to focus on, whether they're enterprise, business, solution, infrastructure, information, um, and, and how do we surface the important stuff? And this takes us to what one of this is, I've been talking about our structured canvas approach. This takes us to some of, the, some of the things that we like to think about in terms of surfacing decisions as first order objects. And that means uh, most organizations still function with decisions being made in a very haphazard way. Uh, uh, you know, it, it's sort of like, unless it's a hundred million dollar or a $50 million investment, you know, we'll just let the team figure out which UI framework they want to use, you know, which server they want to use, which database they want to use, and all of those kinds of things. And what we've done is we've actually surfaced uh, characteristics of decisions that allow us to have a much better and stronger traceability even in the, some of the smallest decisions that are ever, uh, that are made, and 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 many of you know that the difference between an app uh, that you use uh, that you that you enjoy using uh, and that you come back for, uh, and one that you you choose not to use, uh, whether that's food delivery or scheduling flights or picking up a car, uh, uh, you know, a car, uh, can be can actually be based on some of the, the, the quote, smallest decisions that are made during design and delivery. So by surfacing these decisions as first order objects, we can think about the characteristics of the decision, uh, much like Grady Booch has said, in terms of it's things like reversibility, how easy is it gonna be for us to get out of this? It's duration, the information quality and the effort required to do so. There's actually evidence that shows uh, that that single option decisions fail somewhere close to 30% more often uh, than two plus option decisions. Meaning if you're just, you know, kind of saying, well, oh, we've got a whole bunch of developers, they all know Angular, so we're going to go with Angular. That's not a decision. That's actually just you're, you're literally giving up on a decision uh, instead of comparing and contrasting options that may or may not deliver better value to the organization. So really architects are exposing the internal decision-making framework. And that brings me to level three or item three, which is, is that you're designing an ecosystem, not a system. So whether or not you're building a single app or you're building a three-year, uh, you know, working against a three-year program that has uh, numerous systems in place, uh, it is extremely easy to go from the verdant hills of, of designing a, and delivering a, a, a well-crafted ecosystem to a brittle, dry landscape where nothing works and you're just trying to keep the lights on. Because it, it, architects tend, successful architect teams think about ecosystems, not just systems. And this is important because the, the business model uh, ecosystems, the business models themselves uh, are, are uh, changing extremely quickly. Uh, they, they, we're building platform models as opposed to simple or uh, organizational models. Now, we tend to think, we, we're starting to think in terms of how is my product or service going to fit in an ecosystem of services. And we have a lot of different uh, examples of this, even something though, as, as simple as, as uh, traveling, uh, when hopefully when COVID, here, when COVID and we're all vaccinated and we can travel again. If you think about the number of businesses that are involved in, in a travel from even Singapore to Kuala Lumpur, is you know you've got uh, taxis or ubers you've got airlines you've got hotels you've got restaurants you've got uh, shopping you've got a whole whole ecosystem of businesses that need to work together effectively 
Uh, and so as we start thinking about business models, we're actually now looking at co-opetition kind of models where maybe we compete a little, but we actually are part of an entire platform uh, of, of systems and how they need to work together. And this is essential that we start to grow our understanding of it. Also, of course, customers' worlds are changing daily. They've got new tools, new ecosystems, new costs, as well as we have a huge sort of pseudo information uh, a, a system evolving, right? Customers are bombarded with similar information sources and, and they can't tell who's the expert. So one of the, the, the critical aspects of an, in, you know, an architecture team is they, they establish uh, their expertise with their stakeholders, but also that we understand that our customers are now involved in a very intense uh, digital ecosystem. And, and we have to actually participate in that in a way that helps to clarify and simplify uh, their, uh, their, their experiences, uh, as well as to understand that the re results they expect often far exceed an individual transaction, right? I mean, a, 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 you know, I expect my Uber uh, ride to be perfect, even though I may only spend five euro on it, right? So, our, our customers are actually growing in their expectation. And we as architects have to be able to wrap our minds around uh, doing that and building out these sort of platform services and platform thinking. Uh, one of the, the most difficult uh, things for, for architect teams is of course, to be able to hold competing mindsets comfortably in our heads. Um, that, that, you know, the, there, there's this old, uh, expression of course that if you if you have three architects in a room you have 12 opinions uh, and that's because one of the things that we're constantly doing is is building trade-off models uh, where we realize that there is no exact right answer to any given problem there is only the best answer for the context within which we are functioning and being able to do that is truly what i have found an architectural skill uh, what most of the rest of our it partners or business partners uh, tend to have a preferred approach whereas the architect really has to be able to hold you know multiple multiple approaches in their mind and be constantly evaluating evaluating the trade-offs in between them and understand what those might look like. It's also not just about the years of experience, right? We tend to talk a lot about, you know, oh, I have 12 years experience or 30 years experience. It's not just the, the years of experience, it's really the type of experience is what we've found. Again, um, I always kind of come back to the medical profession primarily because it is the, the most rigorous profession of all the professions in the world. And that's for obvious reasons. Um, but again, if you think about how they practice things, uh, I had the, uh, the, I had the, 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 the honor to be invited to see a, a heart transplant in uh, one of the hospitals in Malaysia. And uh, you know, watching the doctors interact with each other, with the staff uh, and how, how they share experience. This is something that we ha have never been truly good at. Um, we're, we're a little bit better than, than some of, other, of some of our business partners, but we've never really, we're, we're very, very addicted to sort of building in ourselves, um, but we have to begin sharing experience building a mentoring culture so that we can, you know, I mean, it, it's almost ludicrous to me that we're still talking about how to implement Agile. Like we know how to implement Agile and we know how to do it at scale. We just don't want to learn um, and, and build that into our new uh, architects coming up. The next generation of architects um, need to be educated more fully. They need to be experientially uh, credentialed uh, because honestly, we're, we're not passing down knowledge from one group to the next. We're simply learning new tech and trying to keep up. And that's a, a, a fundamentally different thing than what you see in other professions. Um, again, quality attribute focus. This is something that's absolutely a, a, a mainstay of architectural thinking and architectural capabilities is 
understanding how quality in, uh, attributes impact the success or the failure or the, uh, the, the systemic quality of a particular system or system of systems. And that means we need to be rigorous about things like usability, reliability, resiliency, uh, scalability, um, as well as the, the other uh, quality attributes listed in, in, in either the ISA standards, the SCS standards, or the IEEE standards. Uh, and you can find a lot of focus on that, but this is where really being having this kind of education and this quality attribute focus helps us to build sustainable, reliable systems. So you see here some of the modern um, modern software and infrastructure design concepts. I know I've I've pulled out as one of my favorite uh, diagrams. Um, by a, a guy named Uwe Fredriksson. And it, uh, it really breaks out some of the things like circuit breaker and timeout that help, help us to deal with, um, deal with uh, service-based systems in highly scalable and, and, and highly uh, uh, resource intensive kinds of service models. But you also have communication and routine maintenance and cues for resources and item potency and you know a number of different patterns that we really need to build into our building codes for software. So I think not only do we need great architects, but we also need uh, to start building a great set of shared knowledge. And this is what we hope the IDABOC uh, will become. And, and, and then we will see local adoption and modifications in Singapore and Malaysia and Sweden, and et cetera. One of the sixth rule, the sixth rule I have for architects is you don't get certainty. You just get comfortable with uncertainty. I think as we begin our journey as architects and as architect teams, we sort of envision this place where you're going to know everything and you're going to have all the information up front and you're going to you're going to have this beautiful digital twin that's going to tell you everything. And, and, and up, to, up until now, I have not seen that in reality. What we end up doing is doing what, what other business people do, which is dealing with a very uncertain future. None of us knew COVID was coming. Uh, the architects have emerged during COVID as a, a, as a force again, primarily because we are so adept at dealing with uncertainty. And keep in mind that any business case, any investment uh, objective or goal that is set by an executive community uh, and any plan or strategy to achieve that, keep in mind that is still just a guess, right? It's still just us saying, we think this might work. And so this notion of being comfortable with uncertainty means that you stop slowing things down and you start participating and looking for facts and figures and control levers that help you guess better every time. And that brings me to the seventh rule that I like to talk about, which is it's not minimum viable product, it's minimum valuable product. An MVP really needs to focus on this notion of what is going to be the product that generates the most return on investment. Now that return may be operational in nature. Maybe it's a, you know, maybe it's an automation activity. Maybe it's an AI activity. Maybe it's an IoT based activity. But ultimately, architects tend uh, need to be focused not on just getting it out the door, but really on what we call value traceability. And this value traceability starts with the notion of what goals are we trying to achieve. Uh, traditionally, you know, IT staff and IT architects, sort of everybody throws a party and you pop the champagne or whatever that, you know, you, 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 you have the, the big, you know, we're done party, um, you know, after we get done with delivery, you know. So we do our requirements and we then make decisions in development and we deliver a product and, and we get it in production and IT traditionally will say, oh my gosh, we're done. Great. We did a great job. Everybody checked off on the requirements. It's in production. But if you start to think like a business person, again, you're not thinking about that because that is actually the point at which the solution is the least valuable to the company. That is the point of delivery in which uh, you've invested the most amount of money, but gotten zero return. 
what really happens in business and what we need to very much internalize in technology and in architecture is that measurement of outcome against the initial goals of the system or systems is what truly excites and delivers value to a business. So it's very important that architects start with goals and, and stay involved all the way through measurement. And we call this the, the virtuous cycle in architecture is that the business to solution to business uh, uh, architecture handoff is, is actually about understanding the true goals of systems getting those delivered and then seeing if they did what we said they were going to do. Maybe that's faster turnaround time uh, uh, on airlines or, uh, you know, more cars off the manufacturing uh, line or uh, more, you know, happier customers or longer, uh, longer engagement with customers in, you know, in, in different ways. And the important thing is that we start to see and measure and understand that value as it's created. Now this is uh, this is one that is, is generally highly controversial, but I, I I've always said the notion of healthy tension is a good thing in agile teams. Uh, Grady Booch, for example, said to me at uh, said one, at one of our conferences, he said, you know, there's a natural friction between agile teams and architects, and I've actually said that that friction it can either be unhealthy or healthy. If it's healthy friction, then it actually leads to better outcomes. Meaning you have a lot of different, I think we're going to see a deeper focus on specialized roles um, than, than we are uh, over, over the next uh, 10 years, uh, where architects, product owners, development, project management, BA, test, uh, really deepen their roles. And there should be a kind of natural tension between those specialist views. Um, and the reason for that, and I grew up in construction. Uh, my grandfather started a construction company and, and, and I used to notice that sort of all of the professionals involved in the delivery of a building uh, kind of had a natural tension with each other. The construction workers weren't, you know, didn't think that the structural engineer knew what they were doing and the structural engineer didn't think what well, the architect knew what they were doing or, you know, there was this sort of kind of camaraderie, but there was also a lot of tension in terms of creating the best outcomes. And that tension itself creates this kind of uh, best outcome uh, if you have deep specialists that really, really know their work. And it's sort of like, uh, you know, in my projects, uh, I currently uh, am building a piece of software uh, for, a, for a product. Uh, and, you know, I have a dev lead and I'm the lead architect. And we very commonly disagree on the right implementation pattern. But that disagreement actually helps us come to a better outcome than if we were to do that alone. So we see a lot more involvement in, in agile uh, products and programs coming um, from the architects. So we're going to see a lot more architects involved in, you know, three teams to four teams, uh, but be proactively involved as opposed to uh, as opposed to the, 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 the his, historically where we've been reactionary, you know, where we just kind of come in and have a checklist and sort of a rubber stamp and say, this is approved. That, that relationship is dying. We're seeing architects be very, very actively involved in their program and project level teams uh, with overlapping skills that create what we call a healthy tension. And then uh, nine, it's not just people skills. We always talk about people skills. A structured stakeholder management set, a set of techniques is needed for us to be able to achieve digital transformation and digital advantage. Uh, it's not just about sort of saying, hey, I, you know, it's nice to meet you and, and oh, wow, how's your, your daughter or son? Those are people skills, right? Being a little bit outgoing. Stakeholder management skills mean that you're truly, truly understanding your stakeholder. Uh, and this is one of another one of our canvases from the structured canvas approach, where you're actually getting in the minds of your stakeholders, understanding their key influencers. What are they saying? What are they doing? What are their pains? What are their gains? And most importantly, what is it that's going to make them successful? Why are they involved in this initiative? Are they, uh, are they involved because they have to be? Are they involved because they want to be? Are they, uh, you know, and how is this initiative going to impact their world? So, so we teach, and, and this is one of about 
of about eight to nine stakeholder canvases that we use to get teams to actually think through a rigorous stakeholder management plan all the way from the single product level all the way up to the value stream level and these structured canvases help you actually get into the minds of the customer of the stakeholders and the other kinds of uh, uh, participants and people in a way that help you to augment what uh, the, the, the outcomes for them, but also to help them augment the success of the initiatives. So really getting strong stakeholder management tools is essential. And then I'm, my sort of final uh, rule is architect teams that don't have an engagement model tend to fail. Meaning if you're not managing your engagement model, which we consider to be the way that the architect practice work, not just process and artifacts, but really how the entire architecture team works together. And this has to include everybody with the title architect and even those without the title architect, meaning things like, uh, things like senior developers that are doing architecture work, et cetera. Uh, building complex things with unskilled people is not only dangerous, but stupid, right? It's if we're going to go build complex things, we need to really, really focus in on our engagement model, our competencies, and then, and, and, and then how we operate uh, an architecture practice. And the IDABOC, as you can see here, is, is kind of a, a digital advantage journey. It focuses on the customer, the business model, the employee operations, but it also gives you a, a set of uh, canvases, tools, and activities related to design, investment planning, complexity, analysis, repositories, governance, and, and it's a very descriptive framework that will, that will help your team uh, be successful. And, and it, it really comes from all of these things that we learn from practice and from reviewing successful architecture practices. So again, here's our top 10 things. And uh, uh, I think I did that in an okay amount of time. And um, I may be wrong, but I think we started at 40. So uh, I don't know how I did Aaron, but that would be, uh, if you have a couple of questions or, or just want to move on that's fine with me we need to move on Bob. uh i guess thank you so much uh for your insightful experience i think your 10 top 10 lesson i think is very very valuable i like the last few as uh, about you know engaging with people and you know knowing right. the others and yeah, that's very very key because many people that think ea or architect is about technical but actually it's not true 80 percent is about <laughs> all right thank you so much